Broadly speaking, vertigo should be divided really into two categories. There is central vertigo and peripheral vertigo. Let's keep this very simple and high yield. Central vertigo is caused by central causes. So when we use the term central, we're referring to the central nervous system, AKA the brain. When we use the term peripheral vertigo, that is what people mean when the layperson says that they're experiencing vertigo. Peripheral vertigo is caused by peripheral causes and the term peripheral really means that it's localized to the inner ear. So again, central vertigo is caused by deficits in the cerebellum, in the brain stem, in the vestibular nuclei of the actual brain itself. But peripheral vertigo or true vertigo in terms of what the lay person says when your average Joe walks down the street, gets a little dizzy and says, I'm having vertigo, that's due to dysfunction of the inner ear. So let's broadly separate these into two categories just so we can mentally make a note of what people mean when your patient comes into the hospital and says that they're experiencing vertigo or when you're taking your USMLE or Comlex and the question says that a patient is experiencing peripheral vertigo or central vertigo. So that's how we separate these into two subcategories. Now, here's a summary of sort of what I've just said. And when we talk about central vertigo, we're talking about dysfunction of the cerebellum, which of course coordinates movement, dysfunction of the brain stem, dysfunction of the vestibular nuclei. When we talk about peripheral vertigo, we're talking about dysfunction of the inner ear, namely the semicircular canal, the cochlea, the vestibulocochlear nerve, and other local structures. I'll get more into the anatomy when I go through peripheral vertigo, but this is just an overview to help you keep track of what I'm talking about in this video. Now, in today's video, we're gonna focus on peripheral vertigo because classically, this is what's gonna come up on exams, and also this is what your patients are gonna often come into the hospital complaining of. So for the sake of today's lecture, we're gonna focus on the orange box. But just to be complete, when we talk about central vertigo, this is due to brainstem strokes, cerebellar strokes, infarctions in that region, and acoustic neuromas. Those are the things that you wanna keep an eye out for on your exam it's not really worth me talking about them because they're so low yield. So the only thing that I wanna point out besides the brainstem strokes, cerebellar strokes, brainstem or cerebellar ischemia is the acoustic neuroma. So just really briefly, recall that an acoustic neuroma sits at the cerebellopontine angle and if it's bilateral, it's associated with neurofibromatosis type two. If you have vertigo, and tinnitus and bilateral acoustic neuromas, think about neurofibromatosis type two, and that'll probably be the direction that the question goes on your exam. But again, today's video is on peripheral vertigo and differentiating the three slash four major types of peripheral vertigo. So with that in mind, let's get into the meat of today's video and talk about peripheral vertigo. So your patients are gonna come into the hospital and they're gonna say, doc, I have vertigo and they're talking about peripheral vertigo. Very rarely will they come in complaining of central vertigo unless they've just had a stroke, in which case, if they've had a cerebellar stroke, they, they probably will not be able to articulate that they're having vertigo. So when someone complains of vertigo, the first thing that you should do after ruling out central vertigo or causes of central vertigo is to consider your differential of peripheral vertigo. And your differential should include three slash four, I'll get into this in just a second, three slash four major diseases. So we have benign paroxysmal positional vertigo or BPPV. We have labyrinthitis slash vestibular neuritis, which are technically two different disease processes that often get lumped together because of how similar they are, and Meniere's disease. These are the three and a half to four, if you will, little diseases that you really need to keep in mind on test day as well as when you're in the hospital. Let's go through these one at a time, talk about the high yields. I'll give you a mnemonic to remember each of them, and this shouldn't be too bad. This is actually very simple to learn and, and very high yield in terms of just having working knowledge of what causes vertigo and how to treat it. So we're going to start with BPPV, or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now, when I was a medical student, I really got overwhelmed by names. And I think that the best way to approach this is to break down the name so you understand what this means. So benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Benign means it's not malignant. So it's not central vertigo. It's not a stroke. It's benign because it's peripheral. Paroxysmal meaning it comes on out of nowhere. So these attacks of BPPV 
truly come on out of nowhere. It seems like you're just walking or moving your head, and then all of a sudden, patient experiences vertigo. Positional, this is triggered by head movement. So I'll talk about this in just a second, but uh, not only is it paroxysmal and coming out of nowhere, but it's caused by positional changes in the head. And we'll talk about the pathophysiology, and this will make more sense in just a moment. And of course, vertigo, because the chief complaint is going to be vertigo. Now, it's very important to understand that when somebody comes in and says that they feel like they're going to pass out, you need to differentiate if they're talking about a pre syncopal feeling, which is to say that they're lightheaded, or if they're talking about vertigo, which is a room spinning sensation. So oftentimes in the question or on the clinical vignette on your exam, you need to differentiate, is it a pre syncopal sensation, meaning the person feels like they're going to faint, or... Is it a vertiginous sensation, meaning vertigo, and the room is spinning? So in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, it is a non-malignant, out of nowhere, caused by head movement, spinning of the room, which is to say benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Okay, so I think the name really does, does you some, some good if you understand what these words mean. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology. So this is a shot of the inner ear. And in the inner ear, you have these three large loops called the semicircular canals. Now, normally, there's fluid throwing, flowing through the semicircular canals. And the semicircular canals are these three areas here shown in red. Now, the, the lining of the tubes or the lining of the canals have these little teeny hairs. Little teeny hairs line these loops. And as fluid thro flows through the loops, the hairs move in space and they help transmit signals to the brain telling you where you are in space based on what's stroking the hair. So it's a really amazing anatomy. And as the fluid flows through the semicircular canals, the hairs are moving, transmitting signals to the brain. And based on the brain's integration of all of the hairs, these little teeny microscopic hairs, we know where we are in space. It's an amazing, amazing anatomy that's evolved over time. Now, the pathology of BPPV comes about when you have dislodging of otoliths from the utricle. So this part that you see the red arrow pointing to is called the utricle. Now in the utricle, you have production of something called otoliths. Otoliths are basically little teeny stones and it's normal to produce them. But what's abnormal is when they get dislodged from the utricle and they enter the semicircular canal. So as these stones are entering the semicircular canal, they're flowing through the fluid that's normally in the canal and the stone itself is brushing up against the little hairs that normally line the semicircular canals. As you might be able to think, this is problematic pathology because the stone rubs the hairs and then sends aberrant signals to the brain, telling the brain that the, the hair is moving in a certain direction, which changes the brain's perception of where you are in space. So because these stones are flowing back and forth, brushing hairs inadvertently, the brain thinks that its head is moving in space in a way that it's actually not. And the way that the patient feels is that they have vertigo. So this is because the otolith gets dislodged from the utricle, enters the semicircular canal, and sends aberrant signals to the brain telling us that we're moving when we're not. It's really due to the stone being dislodged. So that's the pathophysiology, very high yield to understand. My mnemonic for remembering that benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, aka BPPV, is due to stone dislodging is I think about Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I grew up watching WWF, which is now called WWE. So if you watch Stone Cold on pay-per-view or stone for stones in BPPV and PPV is pay-per-view or BPPV, you watch Stone Cold on pay-per-view. That was my mnemonic when I was studying as a medical student to remind me that this was due to stones, AKA otoliths, being dislodged into the semicircular canals, causing benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So that's a stupid little mnemonic if you need one, but if you understand the pathophysiology, you'll do just fine on your exams. Now, how do you diagnose this? You do something called a Dix hall pike maneuver, and this is very high yield. You can actually do this in the hospital when you go on clinical rotations. It's really an amazing maneuver here. So what you do is you take the patient's head and have them seated on the table, you turn it about 45 degrees toward you as the physician. Now, with maintaining that angle, you lean them back on the exam table and then you put their head into extension off the table while maintaining the 45 degree angle. When you do this, you're gonna cause the stone, that otolith that is dislodged, to enter the semicircular canal and you're gonna reproduce 
their symptom of vertigo. In addition to that, you're going to observe nystagmus. And if you see nystagmus and you have the reproduction of vertigo, this is a positive test. This is a positive Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver, and you've diagnosed them with BPPV. Now, I'll warn you that in real life, you should be careful here because patients will become very uncomfortable when you do this, and they might even vomit, so be prepared for that. But that is how you diagnose BPPV. So very, very high yield, Dix-Hall-Pike diagnoses BPPV. How do you treat BPPV? BPPV? Well, you do something called the Epley maneuver. And I know that this picture is a little blurry, but I wanted to pick out the best image to show you what this was. So the Epley maneuver is a way to put the otolith back into the utricle. So it's manipulation of the head to get it out of the semicircular canal and back into the utricle. So what you do is you have the patient sit up on the bed and you lean them back onto a little pillow. Once they're leaning back, looking straight up at the ceiling, you turn their head 90 degrees to the left. You let them hold that position for 30 seconds and then turn their head a full 180 degrees or 90 degrees from center to the right. Hold, hold that for 30 more seconds and then have their whole body turn up onto the side, sort of like in the fetal position. Hold for another 30 seconds and then, and then have them sit back up. Doing this should put the otolith back into the utricle because the otolith is really just that free flowing stone and it's not hard to move it through the semicircular canal. But if you can get it back out of the canal, then you'll stop the symptom of vertigo and help treat them. Now there's also a pharmacologic agent that you can use and I'll talk about that at the very end of the lecture because it's the same drug that treats all of these peripheral vertigos, but we'll get into that at the end of the lecture. So that's BPPV. Remember high yield that uh, it's caused by otolith dislodging from the utricle into the semicircular canal, brushing up against the hairs, telling the brain that the head is moving in space in a way that it's actually not, causing peripheral vertigo. You diagnose it with a Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver. You treat it with the Epley maneuver. And if you need a dumb mnemonic like I did, if you watch Stone Cold Steve Austin on pay-per-view, the stones tell you that it's about otoliths, and pay-per-view tells you PPV or BPPV for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now let's talk about labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis. Now, I call these the inflammatory vertigos. Now, in review textbooks and on websites and in the medical community, labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis are oftentimes combined into a singular disease process. And that's technically not correct. And I'm going to try to be as correct as possible. And for completeness sake, we're going to talk about these separately. So because you see itis at the end of these, you know that we're talking about some inflammatory condition. Itis means inflammation. So labyrinthitis is inflammation of the labyrinth and vestibular neuritis is inflammation of the vestibular nerve or the vestibulocochlear nerve specifically. So oftentimes because of the close proximity in the anatomy between the labyrinth, which is you know made up of the cochlea and parts of the semicircular canals and it's a uh, close proximity to the vestibulocochlear nerve, you get this sort of continuous spectrum of inflammation along that area. So historically, these have been combined into a single disease process, but if you're interested in ear, nose, and throat as a career, the ENT docs seem to think that these are two distinct disease processes. So labyrinthitis is going to typically occur following an upper respiratory infection. So because of the eustachian tube's connection between the inner ear and the mouth and pharyngeal area, any extension of viral or bacterial illness from like the sinuses or the pharynx or even the larynx can come up into the inner ear and inflame the labyrinth. And when that happens, you get reproduction of vertigo because you're having inflammation in the area that's responsible for managing the normal fluid that flows throughout the semicircular canals. So if you've ever had a sensation of earfulness because of fluid, being backed up during an inflammatory condition, that can actually cause vertigo because more fluid will be flowing through your labyrinth and into your semicircular canals, which puts more pressure on those little tiny hairs that in BPPV were dysfunctional. So anytime you put more into the system, you can get vertigo. That's labyrinthitis. There's a little subtle difference in vestibular neuritis. And if you're going to get inflammation of the actual nerve itself, this can still happen following a URI, just like labyrinthitis. But we think that the etiology here is much more viral. So things like hepatitis or herpes simplex or Epstein-Barr virus, if that virus could get up into the vestibular nerve and cause inflammation of the nerve itself, that produces vertigo. And that specifically is termed vestibular neuritis because it's a neuritis, meaning inflammation of a nerve and it's specifically the vestibulocochlear nerve. So they're historically 
discussed as one disease, but they're technically two different diseases. So labyrinthitis is more of inflammation following an upper respiratory infection. Vestibular neuritis, while it could be the same thing, this is more of a virus getting into the nerve itself and burying itself in that nerve, causing vertigo. So not much else to know there, just be able to separate those two in your brain, labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis. Again, I'm gonna talk about the pharmacologic treatment of these diseases at the end of the lecture. The last process that we should talk about in terms of peripheral vertigo is Meniere's disease. Now, Meniere's disease is a classic triad of sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. You have to memorize these three things. You must, must, must memorize them. If you see these three symptoms in the vignette, stop what you're doing. The answer is Meniere's disease. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Really easy mnemonic here. Dirty USMLE has got your back, guys. Men get STVs. Now, I use the STV instead of STD because S for sensory neural hearing loss, T for tinnitus, V for vertigo, and men for many years disease. So if men get sexually transmitted vertigo or STVs instead of STDs. And that reminds me of the classic triad of many years disease. That's literally all you need to know. So be able to recognize the triad and you'll get the question right. Now, we've talked about what these diseases are in terms of their pathophysiology. Now let's talk about the pharmacologic management of vertigo because this might show up on your exam. So the chief agent for the treatment of the actual symptom of vertigo itself is something called meclizine. And meclizine is an H1 receptor antagonist with some anticholinergic properties that decreases not only the sensation of vertigo, you know, the, the sensation that the room is spinning, but also helps a little bit with the nausea and vomiting that often accompanies somebody who constantly feels like their head is spinning and the room is spinning around them. So that's how meclizine works. Incredible drug. You'll use it quite often in your career if you go into primary care, family medicine, etc. But that is how you manage all of these three conditions. Now, I want to pause for a second. It's important to understand that meclizine is the pharmacologic treatment for vertigo in terms of treating it supportively. But I want to make a very high yield point here. In BPPV, you give them meclizine to treat the vertigo, but you still do the Epley maneuver as treatment. In the inflammatory vertigos, you always wanna treat the underlying condition. So if it's due to some type of an inflammation, which is an upper respiratory infection, if that's bacterial, you treat that. You treat the underlying condition. If it's viral, treat supportively and try to help them feel better and reduce the fullness in their inner ear to help alleviate vertigo. So again, even though you give them meclizine to treat the symptom of vertigo, you still wanna treat the underlying condition as the chief treatment for vertigo. So guys, that's it. I hope that you now have a better understanding of the different types of vertigo. I hope you know how to do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver because once you get on clinical rotations as a medical student, you'll be expected to know how to do that. And it's something that you can do in the emergency room or in the office very, very easily. I hope that this video was helpful to you. Best of luck.